Thank you, Bruce, for your kind. Uh, I'd like to talk about photodynamic therapy uh, from cells to clinic for laryngeal carcinoma. Uh, actually, I didn't know the BRI is so far advanced in PDT earlier, so I prepared some very basic one, but I think there is uh, many students here, so I will talk about uh, for them. Uh, my talk includes the basic research background in vitro and in vivo, and PDT for laryngeal carcinoma, and some PDD, and also uh, finally I will introduce BRI Korea. Uh, I think uh, you know about this uh, PDT for photosensitizer is activated with laser or other light, and then it uh, makes some fluorescence. This is used for photodynamic imaging. And the other one is single oxygen, and this is used for photodynamic therapy. If we have an endobronchial tumor like this, then we can uh, inject or inhalate the photosensitizer first, and then introduce the bronchoscope. And through the bronchoscope, we can uh, deliver the laser fiber here. And first, we can uh, diagnose uh, the, uh, with the fluorescence from the tumor and treat it uh, with more laser, <coughs> laser light. Uh, when I started the uh, PDT in 1993 in UCLA, I asked many uh, questions. The first one is, is PDT is more effective than laser alone? Or can I see the fluorescence? Is PDT can kill the tumor cells, or PDT can cure the human cancers? To solve this problem, what I did was, the, this is my uh, first experiment, comparison of tissue necrosis area between PDT and laser alone in general growth tumor. At this time, I used the uh, KTP laser and photosensitizer uh, hyperlysin. And I use cell line, uh, SN1041. Uh, I made it by myself from my patient. You can see this is the hole for fiber delivery. This is a tumor. And the pale area is uh, dead cancer cells. And dark area is live cancer cells. So you can see the, the width of the t uh, cancer cell death. This is PDT alone, uh, laser alone. And with PDT, the more wide area is died, cancer cell died. And the, the next one, this is very simple. I can see the fluorescence. Uh, efforts to make a genograptic tumor and then inject hyperlysin and then uh, lasering it from the outside through the goggle, I can uh, take a picture like this. And in Tanguk University Laser Lab, I started many uh, experiments with PDT. Uh, at first, I designed this uh, triangular box. Where the inside is uh, covered with uh, metal foil to, this, to lasering all the 96 wear with even distribution of light. So I first plate the cells in the well and adding photosensitizer and laser irradiation and uh, check the optical density with uh, MTT. You can see this is control. This is uh, photosensitizer alone. This, air, this side is laser alone. And this, this half is uh, treated with PDT. You can see the cell death. And in the graph, only PDT group has a sharp decline of cell viability. And then uh, I want to know where the photosensitizer is going. Ah. At this time, I used the 9-hydroxy 4 by A. This is, I 
my team has developed from the chlorophyll. And this dye goes to the cytoplasm, not in nucleus. And then, which area in cytoplasm? So, at first, most of the photosynthesis go to the mitochondria, so at first I tried to, to detect the mitochondria with mitotracker and HPVDA and merge it. Ah, some of them go to the mitochondria. And next one was endoplasmic reticulum with ER tracker and non-HPVDA. Then it merged perfectly, so I can <coughs> I can knew that this photosynthesis is localized in endoplasmic reticulum. Some of them in mitochondria. Do you remember the 2002 uh, Korea Japan World Cup? Uh, <coughs> that is the city of Seoul, and this is the city of Plaza. It was crowded with Red Devils. Red Devils is supporter for Korean football team, and it just looks like a PDT. <coughs> now, uh, the cell death mechanism uh, I studied. This is a normal cell, and this column is a PDT with very low dose of photosensitizer. And you can see the apoptotic bodies here. And this, is, uh, this column shows the PDT with high dose of photosensitizer. And in this case, you can see the rupture of cell membrane. And this, we call it necrosis. And this same is uh, transmission EM. You can see the apoptotic, apoptotic bodies in low dose and high dose. You can see the rupture of cell membrane. So, uh, according to the concentration of photosynthesizer, <coughs> we have uh, nuclear DNA staining with propidium iodide uh, staining immediately after PDT. This, this PI is not permeable to cell membrane. So, if the cell membrane is not ruptured, no staining in the nucleus. <coughs> so, uh, control and low dose, there is some in control, no uh, staining. But in high dose, that means necrosis and rupture of the cell membrane, then all the nucleus was stained. And this time, double staining is PI and hex. Hex is permeable through the cell membrane. So, in normal cancer cells, live cancer cells, uh, this hex can stain like this blue color. But some uh, low dose of photosensor, you can ch see, check the, some morphology change. This is apoptosis. And in high dose, all, all the PI goes into the nucleus first, so it stands red. And caspase 3 this is uh, known as apoptotic marker protein. And in PDT group, in four hours, the caspase 3 activity is most higher, then decrease uh, along the time. So in, in this in vitro study, I have, can conclude that PDT in high dose that uh, rupture the membrane and induce the necrosis. And in low dose, it attacks the ER and mitochondria and activates the caspase system and induce apoptosis. <coughs> now, I'm moving to in vivo study. Uh, and in vivo, there are many factors to be considered. The most important thing is depth of light penetration and concentration of photosensitizer in tumor and margin control. This is very important for prevent the recurrence of tumor. There are two ways to give uh, PDT in, in vivo. One is conventional. Uh, give them a uh, photosensitizer at first intravenously or 
inhalation or topically, and then treated uh, from the outside. The other one, if the tumor is very big, then we must uh, insert the fiber into the tumor. If, if it's more than two centimeters, three centimeters, we need uh, more fibers and more times. This is, I call it interstitial PDT. This is a photo for interstitial PDT in nude mouth. And it takes more than, the lasering time is more than 10 minutes. So if you do by yourself with your hand, you, you feel very tired. So I made this instrument like this. And this is the case of complete remission after PDT. Before PDT, here is tumor, it's lasering. And immediate after the treatment, and 14 days, and after uh, three weeks after PDT, there's no tumor. In this case, the tumor has gone at this, but recall again. Here is another, uh, the, and in, the, in this case, no remission at all. And then, growing, growing over. So, uh, there is some volume, I checked the volume change of tumor by treatment modality. Uh, all three modality without PDT has increase of tumor, tumor volume, but only in PDT group has a decrease of tumor volume. This is uh, this was my PDT team at 2007. Uh, Dr. Huang and Dr. Go from China. He is from. Uh, they are my student for PhD course. And he is now working in UCLA, uh, UCLA Pharmacology Lab. And Dr. Go is uh, working as a professor in Qingdao University Hospital. And Professor An is uh, sit there. <laughs> now I'll talk to about head and neck cancer. For head and neck cancer, uh, most of them are squamous cell carcinoma. And you, as you know, head and neck. The function and cosmetics is very important. And there are many sites like face, oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, and neck. And all of the tumors in head and neck uh, usually treated uh, conventionally by surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, all combined of all of this. There are very small indications in head and neck, I think, for PDT. Uh, there are two purposes. One is curative, the other one is palliative. For curative purpose, we usually do the very early cancer, superficial cancer like T1 or T2. That means laser should be able to penetrate the depth of the lesion. And in palliative purpose, uh, recanalization of airway or esophageal obstruction or debulking of big tumors. And the advantage of PDT is highly selective to tumor, and it is less morbidity than other uh, treatment, but more morbidity than laser codectomy alone, and best functional and cosmetic result. But there are many disadvantages also. Phototoxicity, so we must uh, stay in inside one week or two weeks, sometimes one month and high cost of photosensitizers. And I think there are lack of some enough evidence. So in Korean FDA, we still PDT in Korea nowadays, except esophageal and lung cancer. So I cannot do treat uh, the laryngeal cancer patients with PDT anymore. Yeah, uh, on protocol, we uh, give them many times, they don't. If US FDA approve it, we will. That's the answer. And this is setting of uh, PDT for uh, laryngeal cancer patient. You see this is the diode laser machine. 
It cost me around $200,000 at the year of 2001. Very expensive. Nowadays, far cheaper. And the laser light is delivered through the fiber. And, and to protect the normal area, especially the subglottic uh, area. Subglottic area is treated with PDT, with normal tissue. There may be a lot of edema. So it makes the patient uh, difficult to breathe. So protect the underneath of the region is uh, carotenoid and aluminum foil like this and uh, drapes and lasering the site. And just after the PDT, you should just a subtle change. And this is the picture of the PDT. This patient has a very uh, superficial T1B lesion. At first, I recommend him radiation therapy. That's the best, in my opinion. But he, wa he don't want to uh, radiate his body. <coughs> So I decided to give, treat him with PDT. So cover the <coughs> underneath of the tumor. This is very important, I think. And then lasering. <coughs> region in four points uh, from posterior part to middle, anterior, and uh, anterior commissure. Anterior commissure is the most frequent side of recurrence. So if uh, the tumor in, uh, involved in anterior commissure, I think it's more than T1. More than, sometimes it's T4, but it looks like T1. That's the region. It takes uh, around 12 minutes. Uh, my hands shaking some. Just after the treatment, no change, as you know. So I share some interesting case with me. Uh, no, no, I will. Uh, at that time, I used the uh, photogen. Photogen is uh, very similar to photoprin, but it was made from uh, Russia. Uh, surprisingly, I visited Russia. They do many photosensitive develop, and they use the photosensitive at first to the human, not in animal. But it works. <coughs> This uh, uh, old gentleman has a horse knee for two months, and he has also the region at right vocal cord. And the impression was laryngeal cancer T1A and 0. Suspension biopsy is frozen, uh, revealed the squamous cell carcinoma. So instantly I do laser codectomy type 3 at that time. This is the case. So I, I cannot. Uh, see exactly the margin, so I cut through the center, and then I can find the no, uh, normal margin and cut it down posteriorly at first and anteriorly. Unfortunately, it has a, a recall, and it was a squamous cell carcinoma, so I recommend him RT or big surgery, but he denied all of this. So PDT is him, is photogen, and total 138 joules. This is the case uh, with uh, lasering, and just after lasering, and one month after, no tumor, uh, nearly normal looking larynx. So he uh, has discharged soon, and now 10 years and he stay, but he's smoking again for 10th anniversary. <laughs> yeah. 
witnesses, very superficial T1. But you see the, the until the commission was involved at that time. That means it would be T1 or would be T4. If uh, usually with uh, some uh, tumor like this, fungating tumor, I just cut it out with laser. That's all. 95% cure rate. But in this case, less than 80% with uh, laser uh, codectomy or irradiation. He, uh, this is the patient, and this is me. He is the owner of a big Korean barbecue restaurant in my area. He invited uh, all the Korean head and neck surgeon, and he is singing a song here. <laughs> His voice was very good. And this is some unhappy case, but now he's happy. Uh, also another gentleman with horse knees for three months. Uh, irregular hyperemic with leukoplakia. Code mobility was very good, so I scored him T1B. T1B means both sides of vocal cord. T1A means one side of vocal cord. I treated him radiation, and just after three months after radiation, there was a whitish plaque at both vocal cord, and biopsy reveals common cell carcinoma. So uh, I recommend him total laryngectomy, but he denied. And after some, he uh, get back again my clinic, ask me another options. He already uh, radiated, so no option except uh, surgery. But I think about the PDT. This is maybe the first case uh, treated with PDT after recurrence, after radiation. So in this case, same method. This is the case. But after the treatment, uh, as you know, after radiation, there is always the risk of uh, radio necrosis of cartilage or radio necrosis of a bone. In this case, there was a lot of crust here. So I, so I think this is uh, radio necrosis of cartilage, maybe. So I treated him hyperbaric oxygen therapy and many times of debrima. And finally, after 80 days, he was cured. But after six months, he must take out his larynx like this. You know, you see uh, the anterior commissure and subglottic area, there is a tumor recurrence. But with his uh, laryngostoma, he's still happy. And at first, I did some uh, PDD, but not nowadays. This is uh, with ALA inhalation. You can see the uh, fluorescence here. And at that time, I used the inside to spectrophotometry like this. This, uh, this curve means the cancer. And in the end of bronchial region, you cannot see where the tumor is exactly, but with uh, all the fluorescence, we can see where it is. And this my lovely dogs, my house, and in the fall and in the winter. This is my backyard. And next is I introduced some for BRI Korea. It just started last December, just uh, over one and some days. I'm the appointed as director of BRI Korea, and this is my hospital, uh, my campus. This is a dental area. This is other 
heart, uh, liberal heart and science like this. And here is uh, my hospital. Uh, my hospital is located in just uh, 80 kilometers south from Seoul, nearby Seoul. Every important thing is nearby Seoul in Korea. BRI Korea is very important, that's why it is located in nearby Seoul. Uh, this is Dangui Hospital. It is uh, established in 1994, very young. And this is inpatient ward. This is outpatient ward. And this is uh, College of Medicine. And on the third floor over here, BRI Korea is located. You see? We have a master plan of this campus in 2020. There are many more buildings and more beautiful. And I think uh, here is the BRI Korea now. But in 2020, I hope BRI Korea Center building here. <laughs> And I have worked the last 10 years with Dangook Medical Laser Research Center. It was founded in 2001 and funding from Korean National Fund. And we did a lot of translational research in medical area. And we do some basic research, preclinical research, and then develop and commercialize machines. We have basic research on PDT, low-level laser therapy, laser therapy, and clinical test, and develop medical device using laser or LED. For PDT, I use it for cancer and so dermatology regions like acne or uh, actinic keratosis. And also, we are focused on vestibular cochlear system in inner ears, and also wound healing, hair growth, this can make some money for our lab and pain control and tissue regeneration. Also, my hospital has a clinical trial center. So we did a lot of clinical trial with a machine developed in our lab. And we do some education for laser. Our education is very, I think it, this is very important for the doctors or researchers who handle with laser. Uh, for my topic is laser safety, writing the laser surgery workshops, laser tissue interactions, etc. This is a laser safety uh, course. If we use the PVC fiber, this is a, uh, there is oxygen like a general anesthesia setting. If we treat it with laser, there would be a fire and toxic plumes out. Maybe here some cyanide, as you mentioned this morning. Mm -hmm. And so from this, we can learn don't use CV tube with laser. And this is a case in another hospital, Seoul National University Hospital. Uh, my teacher has this. And kindly, he take photo and give it to me. This is a papilloma, a papilloma in larynx. This is very difficult to treat. Always recall and recall, recall. This may be the maybe 13th operation for him. Uh, this during the surgery there was a fire, and pull out the endotracheal tube and the. Check the uh, whole airway. There is a burn in uh, lower trachea. This is carina, maybe, and burn also in main bronchus. But fortunately, he saved his life. And after this surgery, no more surgery. He cured. Maybe in the same period, there was a same accident in California. At that case, uh, put it out, but half of them left his uh, truck here, so he was died. I read it in newspaper. Also, we did a T 
tissue, laser tissue interaction every year. This is uh, laser absorption according to the colors, uh, many uh, skin uh, surgery. And in 1995, I first uh, held a hand-on laser workshop for laryngeal surgery in dog. This is me. Uh, at that time, many uh, Korean doctors coming. And in 19, uh, 2006, I did uh, some international workshop. At that time, uh, Dr. Kuri from UC San Francisco came as a lecturer. This is my uh, laser workshop team at the be beginning of the party, in the middle of the party, at the end of the party, just the empty bottles. And this is my hat. The BRI Korea is not built in just one day. We have a very long relationship between. At first, uh, Professor Lee has visited the BRI in 2007 and give a, I heard that he has a lecture here on maybe LLT. And after that, we had the MOU between BRI and uh, Danjuk Medical Laser Research Center. And according to the MOU, we have sent many uh, researchers. I, I think you can remember Dr. Huang and Dr. Baek and Dr. Kang. And another one is Dr. Hong, just left. In 2010, uh, the Danguk and UC Irvine Chancellors has an MOU for both uh, universities. And at that time, the Danguk folk dance team has a performance here. They are here, maybe a uh, male Kang. <coughs> and last year, I've, I first met uh, Brian uh, at the SP meeting. We have a uh, head and neck fashion. Also, I met first uh, Bruce here. We have discussed about BRI Korea project here. And then, just after 30 minutes talk, we, <coughs> we agreed with uh, joint research via BRI Korea. Right? Thank you. And then we have signed the joint research agreement and uh, Bruce uh, came to Korea and Tangu University and gave us a lecture, Engineering Optics from Bench to Bedside. You see, uh, the D is deleted, misprint. <laughs> yeah? But I think most of uh, research from bench go to the beside, not bedside. This is their meaning, right? <laughs> <laughs> And finally, last December 4, uh, the Korean National Research Fund and Ministry of Educational Science and Technology announced the funding for BRI Korea. We started with seven pro professors, biomedical optics, medical engineering, microbiology, surgery, dermatology, and head and neck surgeon. And I'm picking five products, biomedical optics, tissue engineering, microbiology, and we hired only seven researchers. We have uh, some core research about dosing and functional imaging, low-level laser therapy, and EMR. We have uh, some joint work for this. This slide is adopted from uh, Trombo's lecture on last year. We have I think we can have a mutual benefit on training, research, multi-center trials, commercialization. And another slide from him. This is very important, I think. BRI Korea builds on strong foundation of high impact collaborations. Dedicated support will reinforce this relationship and provide a two-way sustainable program. 
So I hope the BRI Korea would be the world leading research center for medical optics in 2020. Oh, the first BRI Korea symposium will be held in uh, this April, at the end of this April, and the venue hotel is Sogi Pokal Hotel, Jeju Island in Seoul. Jeju Island is a very beautiful island, and this hotel is uh, just a seaside with uh, this uh, big uh, green yard and uh, very beautiful scenery. And this is last winter season at this hotel with my daughter and my son. My son is uh, studying in UC uh, uh, Illinois, Urbana Champaign, not UC. Thank you very much for your kind attention.